Why is this couple smiling? Perhaps they found hope, meaning, and purpose in the Book of Revelation. Nearly 2,000 years ago, a lonely man on a distant island received a remarkable vision. Some readers have been frightened by his vision, but many more have found in it the hope, meaning, and purpose they were looking for. And now, here are your hosts, Dr. John Pauline and Dr. Graham Bradford. Welcome to Revelation, Hope, Meaning, Purpose. I'm John Pauline. And I'm Graham Bradford. And uh, Graham, why don't you just take a moment and summarize our previous program? Sure. John, last time we dealt with the safeguards of how to study this book and make sure you keep on track. And we also spent some time on how Jesus gave a sermon on the end of the world, which reached not only from the days of his time, right through history, right until he returns at the end of the world. And the book of Revelation is really an unfolding of this sermon. And that means that it has, gives hope, meaning and purpose to every generation of Christians, and even more so as we get towards the end of history. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I remember we also talked a little bit about the issue of persecution, uh, how ancient Christians uh, would have been affected by neighbors and others who might turn them in and uh, they might suffer imprisonment, sometimes uh, even death. And we yeah. explored uh, how, how God relates to some of those things. Yeah. And I think one thing we came up with was the idea that uh, learning to trust God Mm. becomes really, really critical. It's, it's, mm. it's the view that you have of God that determines how you can handle suffering when it comes. If you can see light at the end of the tunnel, mm -hmm. and if, you can, if it makes sense and you can see some purpose, you can put up with an awful lot more, can't you? You really can. You see, here's the thing. It is the conviction of those who wrote the New Testament that the clearest picture of God a person can get is the picture that they saw when a man named Jesus came to this earth. And what a difference it made. Mm -hmm. It made all the difference, didn't it? And that's what our program is about today. Absolutely. God okay. stepped into history through Jesus Christ and that makes a lot of difference. Well, let's begin <clears throat> by taking a look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. It's the very mm -hmm. first verse in the book. Okay. It says here in verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave to him to show his servants what must soon take place. I'd like to note a number of things in that text. Uh, first of all, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ. It doesn't say the revelation of Middle Eastern oil. It, it doesn't say the revelation of Armageddon. Uh, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, if you study this book of Revelation, you don't get a clearer picture of Jesus you probably haven't interpreted the book correctly. And that's often been the case, hasn't it? It's been a happy hunting ground for all sorts of wild, sensational mm -hmm. theories. Yeah. If we stay on track with the book's own introduction, mm. I think we're safer. And this word revelation comes from a Greek word, apocalypsis, from which we get the word apocalypse. And uh, it's actually a combination of two Greek words, uh, sort of take the cover off. I imagine somebody in the kitchen, there's something good smelling there, and you take the cover off the pot mm. to see what's inside. Mm. In a sense, the book of Revelation takes the cover off mm. Jesus. It gives us a picture of Jesus we would never have had otherwise. Mm. Uh, otherwise, in the New Testament, Jesus is a human being who walks this earth. Revelation opens up a more cosmic picture. And particularly of who Jesus this is. very first scene we're going to look at shortly, where we see Jesus in a way we've never seen him before mm -hmm. revealed. And it's exciting. Yes. It, it sets the tone for mm -hmm. the rest of the book. Yeah, it's exciting. Yeah. Now, one thing we talked about a little bit last time was the idea of the authorship of the book, mm -hmm. that uh, the book of Revelation is written by a man named John, who uh, most people think was a disciple of Jesus. And uh, this man, John, receives a vision from heaven. So in this verse, you see God giving something to Jesus, Jesus passing it on to John, and then John writes it down for the church. So there's a chain of revelation coming here. This is not just a human book, mm. but it's a book that is designed to uh, tell us more about God and his perspective on things. And this is so important because when we later on talk in this series, we talk in terms of uh, John did this, John did that, but really it's Jesus 
speaking right. through John, and we must make that clear. That's yeah. right. Yeah. I'd like to see verse 1 uh, just one more time, if we could, uh, because in that verse it makes a very interesting comment. It says that He made it known by sending His angel to His servant John. Now, translators often try to be helpful. This time it wasn't so helpful. This made it known is actually a technical term in the Greek language. It is a term for signify, to describe the future in terms of symbols, Mm. you see? So this is a very technical term. The book of Revelation is signified. It is symbolized. In other words, don't take it too literally. Mm. As you're reading through, there's some amazing stories here, some some beasts with seven heads and ten horns. There's some scary imagery. I bet you've never seen uh, an animal out in the Australian outback with seven heads and ten horns, Not even in Australia. No. Nor New York City either. Yeah, Australia (laughs) does have some strange animals there. Big grasshoppers. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, We like the koalas a little better than the grasshoppers. But anyway, uh, the book of Revelation is using some of these strange creatures as symbols. Mm. So, as you're working through the book of Revelation, you want to understand, what is this pointing to? The literal language is pointing to something else. It's mm. pointing beyond itself. Mm. And as you study Revelation, uh, you want to give careful attention to that. What I like, John, is the things that matter most are clear. Mm-hmm. It can be understood. The clue comes within the Scripture itself. You don't have to reach out and speculate and superimpose it. The mm. things that matter are really clear. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. I'd mm. like to direct our attention now to a few verses just beyond this because in verses 4 to 6 of chapter 1, it, uh, how should we put it, it tells in plain language, perhaps the only time in the book where the language is quite plain, it tells us what the book is about. Mm-hmm. Uh, Revelation 1 verse 4, John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from Him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before His throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To Him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by His blood, and He has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve His God and Father, To Him be glory and power forever and ever. You remember at the close of the last program, we highlighted that point that uh, through Jesus Christ, uh, people are elevated as kings and priests. Kings uh, were the highest status in the political realm in the ancient world. Mm. Priests had the highest status in the religious realm. Mm. And I have learned uh, through experience that as one begins to realize the way God looks at us, the way that God thinks of us, it can help to build one's uh, v- sense of value. We are so precious in the mm-hmm. eyes of God. Mm-hmm. We put too low a price on ourselves. We really do. That's right. In God's eyes, everybody mm-hmm. is somebody. That's right. And I love mm-hmm. that. I love that. Now, an interesting thing that I would point out in these three verses, Revelation 1, 4 through 6, is there's three threes in this text which is very interesting. First of all, it says to the one who is and was and is to come. And uh, most uh, scholars take that as a reference to uh, God the Father, to the the great uh, transcendent God. Um, Then it says, from the one who is, was, and is to come, that's a three, and the seven spirits before His throne and Jesus Christ. So you have three persons, all right? God communicates to us through the book of Revelation, but that communication is coming from three persons, uh, which uh, Christians, I think, have generally called God the Father, uh, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Uh, There is one God. Uh, Christians agree with their Jewish friends and their Muslim friends. There is one God. Uh, We're not talking about multiple gods. Uh, the, The pagans believed in multiple gods. But this one God has come to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's kind of a mystery. I, even in saying it, I'm thinking, man, yeah. that, that's, that, that splits my head down the I've middle. I've often said it's not contrary to human logic, it's mm-hmm. over and above. Yeah. Uh, if we had made up a religion, we would uh-huh. make up a religion different, wouldn't we? Yeah. That here is something that is over and above human understanding. Yeah. yeah. But then there's a third three in verses four to six, and that is that Jesus Christ is the one who loves us, the one who freed us, from our sins by His blood, and He has made us kings and priests. So you have uh, a trinity of persons, 
and then you have a trinity of actions, and these are the actions of Jesus. So the book of Revelation sees Jesus as a high and exalted person. Who was this Jesus? Hmm. This Jesus was a human being who walked on this earth. He got sweaty. He got tired. He got uh, dirty. Hmm. I mean, imagine. He felt pain. Walking uh, five miles or, or, or 10 kilometers or something like that, yeah. and you're walking alongside, hmm. and you know, there's a bit of a s sniff of uh, body odor or something. Are these people likely to say, this must be God? Mm. No. The book of Revelation is making an incredible claim that this man who walked the earth, mm. this man who was known and touched and mm. felt, this man was actually the great God of the universe. And it blows you away. Yeah. You say, why would he bother? Why mm -hmm. would he care for us enough. And one of the things we want to do mm. in this program is, is examine that claim. Mm. Does it have historical validity? Mm. Did Jesus actually exist? Mm. Um, was he what Christians claimed him to be? Is the Bible reliable exactly. in what it says about him? Exactly. Yeah. But before we do that, I want to remind us of a text that we looked at briefly in the last program, and that is Revelation 1, 9, and 10. And I'll just summarize. John is on the island of Patmos, and he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And, and that text inspired me one day when I was on the island of Patmos. Mm. Let's take a look. Okay. I'm standing on an ancient road here on the Isle of Patmos, and not far from the cave where the Orthodox Church believes that John received the vision of Revelation. He tells us that I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. It was not far from this very place that John received the vision that became the heart of the book of Revelation. Someone was telling me when they saw that that it might be a lot of fun to run up and down that road on a motorcycle. I think people do. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I suspect that they do. Yeah. But uh, let's put up a map once more so people can locate where this is. You can see the island of Patmos is off the coast of what we would today call Turkey. And this book of Revelation was written initially to churches in seven cities in the western part of Asia Minor. It's because of those churches and because yeah. of Patmos that we have this magnificent book. And this book reveals Jesus in a way we've never seen him before. It is an unveiling of Jesus. And coming up after the break, we're going to have the second half of the chapter dealing with the first vision. John was amazed when he saw Jesus as he is in this vision. Coming up straight after the break. one of the most incredible visions ever recorded in Scripture. Here we see Jesus revealed as never before. John, I think I'll read it here. Revelation chapter 1, mm -hmm. and it's verse 13 uh, through to verse 16. It talks here, it says, And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a flaming, a blazing fire. His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance." Wow. John felt a bit overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he fell down. This is Jesus as he's never seen him before. You know, what a, what a picture of Jesus it is. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at this, this artist impression here of what was really happening. Someone working with me on this uh, series said, you know, that's not the sort of Jesus I think I could hug. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, you know, he's got a sword coming out of his mouth. Mm -hmm. And someone else said to me, but look, look at his eyes. You know, they don't look friendly. Mm -hmm. But in his feet, but this is all symbolic, as you said earlier, mm -hmm. but it has meaning yeah. and it is relating to all that's going to come later on through Revelation, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It really is. So um, every part of this is of great significance as Jesus relates to his church. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, what interests me here is you have Jesus in the context of these candlesticks. And uh, this is an immediate reminder of the Old Testament temple uh, back in, uh, 
in ancient times, ancient Israel and uh, contemporary Judaism at the time that John uh, was writing. And uh, the candlestick was part of the temple service there. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting, for uh, a number of years, I had uh, gone with tour groups to Laodicea, one of the seven churches in Asia Minor. If you go to Turkey today and go to ancient Laodicea, uh, 10 years ago, it was simply farmer's fields. Mm. Uh, there were three huge depressions there that were said to be ancient theaters or amphitheaters. And uh, it was clear that a vast city was there. You walk across the farmer's field and you see bits of pottery and bits of marble and so mm. forth. You're two feet down. Mm. This is incredible city. I've had the same experience. Yeah. And you say, why doesn't somebody do some work here? Yeah. And sure yeah. enough, uh, Turkish mm. government has been doing that very recently. And to be commended. Yes, mm. and uh, you had a chance to see that for the first time just mm. uh, a little while ago. I was absolutely ago. blown away, yeah. absolutely blown away. Yeah. That's right. Mm. Well, one of the things we found there in Laodicea was a description of the Jewish candlestick right on one of the columns. Why don't we have a look at that? Okay. I'm sitting in the central square, the marketplace of ancient Laodicea. And uh, among the ruins that we find here is an interesting column. And on this column, you see a seven-branch candlestick. You can probably follow my finger just there. You see the seven-branch candlestick, and it's superimposed by a cross. One of the special themes of our series is how much Christianity is related to Judaism. In fact, the two did not start out at all as separate religions. Uh, but Christianity was an expansion and extension of Judaism as understood by the people of that time. You cannot understand the book of Revelation unless you understand its heritage, unless you understand the sanctuary themes, unless you understand the Old Testament, the, the scriptures of Judaism. And so this has got to be a crucial part of everything we do when we're studying the book of Revelation. Yeah, John, that is surprising, isn't mm -hmm. it? Like candlesticks, a Christian symbol of a cross together, you know, it, it is surprising. Well, uh, some people would be uh, perhaps immediately repulsed by that and say, you know, what do these two have to do with each other? Yeah. And uh, so I invited a scholar of Judaism to talk to us a little bit about that. What, what is the relationship uh, between Christianity and Judaism as it was back in John's day? Okay, he's one and of your colleagues. He's a colleague of mine named Jacques Ducan, and okay. uh, let's listen to what he has to say. Okay. Sure. To speak about uh, the Jewish character of the New Testament faith is certainly not a new assignment, because for the first time we had this defined by Apostle Paul himself. I read in the book of Acts in chapter 24 that Paul dis identified himself as the one who worships the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the Torah and in the prophets, and I have hope in God, which the Jews themselves also accept that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. So he was just here describing, uh, the Apostle Paul, the particular connection which relates his faith to uh, the Hebrews uh, of, the, of, the, of ancient Israel and also the Jewish contemporary. And indeed, when you uh, explore that connection, you realize that it is much more connected, much more serious than we, we think. I mean, people are questioning that, but uh, the, 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 the New Testament faith is enrooted in the Hebrew Scriptures. It defines itself as a faith on the Hebrew Scriptures, believing in the Torah, the law, and the, and the prophets, believing in the, same, in the same faith, the God of hope, the same hope, the God of resurrection, and also uh, uh, identifying uh, their faith as a faith which is uh, made of keeping the law of God and at the same time believing in the God who is going to save mankind. Uh, and indeed, when you read the, the scriptures, uh, whether it is uh, what it has been called the New Testament, whether it is the Gospels or even go to the book of Revelation, you realize that it is nurtured by that particular connection. The book of Revelation, for instance, starts with a beatitude, like uh, uh, those beatitudes we find in the, in the, in the Psalms 
or uh, the, the same beatitude which ends the book of, of, of Daniel, blessed is he. S and also when you read the, the book of Revelation, you realize that the whole book is animated, is nurtured, fed by many uh, new, uh, uh, allusions to the so-called Old Testament. We have about 2,000 allusions to the Old Testament. This is the most uh, Hebrew text, the most Hebrew book of the New Testament. Of course, uh, when we uh, read uh, today, when we, look, when we consider what Christianity is and what Judaism is, we tend to think that we have two different faiths. But at that time, the early Christians did not identify themselves as a, a new faith. It was an emphasis, it was a, a, a development of the, uh, an expansion, let's say a blossoming of the, of the Hebrew scriptures, but it was not something, something new. So uh, again, to come back to the, what the Apostle Paul says, uh, uh, not only he refers to the scriptures here, um, but he refers to his roots, to the God of my fathers, so you have the same history, the same roots, believing all things which are written in the, the law and in the prophets, a way of re referring to the, the Old Testament. I have hope in God, which the Jews themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. So he has the same past, the same future, and then also the same point of connection that is the Hebrew scriptures. This is what, how at that time the New Testament faith was defined, and uh, uh, we could also say the same today if we want to be consistent. That was really important. Mm -hmm. You know, many people would never appreciate what he said, and it seems like these people to whom John originally wrote must have really known their Old Testament. This vision of Jesus that you read is just riddled with quotations from the Old Testament. Mm. But there's even more, a very shocking, surprising thing. Mm -hmm. We visited a pagan temple in uh, modern-day Turkey. Look what we found out. Mm -hmm. I'm standing in front of one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Well, I guess it's not one of the seven wonders of the modern world. What happened here and why is it important and where did it go? Well, this was the Temple of Artemis, which was the first major temple in the ancient world to be built entirely of marble. It was huge, it was the centerpiece of uh, worship here in Ephesus, and uh, it actually is a pointer to something even bigger. You see, there was an overarching goddess in the ancient world that transcended just Asia or Ephesus, and that goddess was named Hecate. Hecate uh, could be called different names in different places. Here in Ephesus, she was Artemis, uh, the goddess of the Ephesians. In Rome, she might be Diana. In uh, heaven, she would be Selene or Luna. So Hecate could take many different names and uh, take on different forms. What is significant about her is that she was called the first and the last. She was called the goddess of revelation. She had the keys of heaven and hell. She could travel up to heaven, travel down to hell, come back and tell everybody here what that was all about. Why is this significant? for the book of Revelation, particularly chapter 1, because in chapter 1 of Revelation, John describes Jesus as the first and the last, as the holder of the keys of heaven and hell, as the one who is the one who brings the revelation. And the question arises, why would John use language that refers to a pagan goddess and describe Jesus in that way? Why would Jesus want to be described in that way? And I think the answer is simply this. The principle that you find throughout the Bible, God meets people where they are. In other words, he uses their time, their place, their circumstances, their beliefs, their language, in order to bring them a little bit closer understanding of what God is like. In this particular case, what would the message be? The message would be, that whatever the pagan of Ephesus saw in Hecate, in Artemis, the things that they hoped to receive, if they really wanted those things, if they really wanted to have their place 
they would look to Jesus. Very interesting. I think that might be a surprise to, uh, to some of our viewers uh, because it raises the important question, you know, why all these things? Uh, many people feel Christianity and Judaism, you know, can't put them together. Mm. Certainly a uh, pagan goddess, what does that have to do with anything? But apparently when God reveals himself, mm. he meets people where they are. Mm. He comes to the place mm. where they are. Mm. And uh, that means that he is deeply interested in being understood. And one of the reasons we haven't understood the book of Revelation is we haven't taken the time to understand it in the original context, mm. in the original place. Mm. And see, that brings us to the point for the second half of our program today. Because when God said, I want to go the full distance, I want to go to the ultimate place of communicating who I am, mm. He decided to send His Son as a Amazing. human being, Amazing. to bring him to this earth, yeah. to have him walk to this earth, yeah. to possibly be misunderstood as just a human being Amazing. in order to show us what God is like yeah. after the break. Okay. back. We promised to talk uh, a little bit more about uh, Jesus' extraordinary claims. And uh, Graham, uh, why don't you take the lead on this one? Sure. John, right here in the text, it says that Jesus said that he is the first, the last, the living one. I was dead and behold, I am alive forever and ever and hold the keys of death and Hades. Is there a more important verse anywhere in scripture than this one? He is the one who holds our destiny. If this is true, what he claims, we have hope, meaning and purpose for the future, don't we? If he wasn't whom he claims, we're in trouble, deep trouble. Let's have a look at the other claims that Jesus gave because he did make a significant number of claims, didn't he? Okay, let's just have a look at them and we'll see them. Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, to have pre-existed. He said before Abraham was, I am. He also said that angels obey him. And he went on to make other claims as well. He said he could foretell the future of this world, which we saw in our previous program, didn't we? Mm -hmm. He said he could forgive sin. And he said, if you kill me, I will raise myself back to life again. He claimed that he would raise himself back to life. Now, what would you think of me if I said that? John, you kill me, but in three days, I'll raise myself back to life. What would you think? I would think you'd lost it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This man made extravagant claims. Now, if he was whom he claimed to be, we have a hope and a purpose and a meaning in life. So if, let, let me get what you're saying here. You are saying that uh, if one buys into the claims mm -hmm. that Jesus has made, if, if you take these seriously, then it's going to make all the difference in our lives today? Oh, all the difference, all the mm -hmm. difference. You know, because he says here in this text here, mm -hmm. I am alive and live alive at this moment forever. He said, I am alive and live forever and ever. I hold the key of death and Hades. In other words, because he lives, we will live too if we should die. Mm -hmm. That's precious, isn't it? Mm -hmm. What a difference it makes in how we live. So yeah. this man, the claims he makes, you know, are worth investigating. At least a person ought to spend some time thinking about these claims because if they're true, then life has meaning, hope for the future. So we're going to look now at this man, Jesus Christ, and we're going to say now, John, let's look at it as an historian would look. Let's look okay. at it from pure history. Mm -hmm. If I were to ask you, how do you know there was such a person as Alexander the Great? You know, have you ever seen him? Have you reached out and touched him? Yeah, you know, how do you know he existed? Maybe it's a, a myth. Well, sort of a no, no, and no. Uh, I think probably part of the reason that uh, that we would think he existed is because he's in the history books. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but the, you never met him. No, 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 definitely not. Yeah. So in a, in a way, you're trusting somebody else's word. Mm -hmm. Okay. And alongside what you said, I would also say that if he never existed, he, we leave a huge hole in history because who conquered the Persians? Who set up the, mm. the Grecian Empire? Yeah. I mean, history suddenly has a great gap, doesn't it? 
Well, it was incredible. Uh, you had this huge Persian Empire, and Alexander uh, starts out with this little army, and about five years later, uh, there's no more Persian Empire, and he's off in India somewhere. It was a, yeah. It's an incredible story, but the whole world shifted, and mm. if Alexander didn't exist, then how did right. that happen? And if I were to ask you, how do you know there was such a person as Adolf Hitler? Did mm. you ever meet him, talk to him? How do you know? Well, I think when my mom lived in Berlin in the 1930s, she said he visited somebody across the street once. So that's a, a bit of a word of mouth uh, on that one. But still, I think that there's a lot of trust in what others have done. But I, I, I like the point you're making. Uh, you have to have an Alexander the Great or history doesn't make any sense. Mm. Even though maybe there's only a handful of ancient uh, evidences that he existed. Mm. And for Hitler. We would have people alive today yeah. who would have had close contact with him. Yeah. We have all the evidence of World War II mm -hmm. and all the graves and the battlefields. Yeah. And if this man was just a myth, mm -hmm. then you've got a lot of explaining to do with history. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have in the first century, beginning of the first century, there was no such person in this world as a Christian. Christians mm -hmm. just didn't exist. Mm. By the end of that first century, the Christian faith had spread right throughout the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. Now something happened during that century to cause the Christian church to come into existence. Mm -hmm. We have evidence that, that men and women were going up and down that little land of Palestine saying, Jesus Christ is alive. We have seen him put to death, but he's alive. Mm -hmm. Now, if he never existed, I mean, could I go up and down this country talking about a man who'd been put to death and was alive and people just accept it? Mm -hmm. It wouldn't happen, would it? No, I don't think you so. You cannot account for the rise of the Christian church in the first century in that tiny little land of Palestine if this man never existed. He was put to death in a very public way. There's no question he was put to death. People back there don't question. People often today question, but back there it was a public event. He was put to death. Now, what evidence do we have for the resurrection of Jesus? That's the point. Is he alive today as the text here claims? Here we're looking at real history. If we were just going to history as an historian would, or maybe even better, if I was just weighing things up in a court of law, like a lawyer making a case, we would say we have more evidence for the existence of Jesus than say even Hitler or Alexander the Great. And I believe it tests our honesty because really you look at the details as given in Scripture regarding the life of Jesus. It wasn't long ago they found the family grave of Caiaphas, the high priest, when Jesus was there being put to death. We have now evidence in Caesarea since the 60s of uh, he was the governor of Judea at the time Jesus was put to death. Oh, you mean uh, Pontius Pilate? Pontius Pilate, yeah, yeah. I think I've seen that. Yeah, yeah. 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 And Herod and other characters mention the life of Jesus. You know, we have historians who talk about this. Mm -hmm. One famous historian who stands out, of course, is Josephus. Mm -hmm. And he made a statement which we believe has been you know, tampered, tampered with a little bit, but take away the tampering. Scholars have worked over it very closely. And this Jewish historian was born about 30 years after the death of Jesus. He lived right there in Jerusalem. So he comes not long after these events. And this man was not a Christian, which makes his testimony about Jesus even more, more exciting, really. Let's have a look at the quote that Jesus, Jesus, of Jesus regarding what happened from Josephus, all right? Let's have a look at it. Josephus wrote, Now there arose about this time a source of further trouble in one Jesus, a wise man who performs surprising works, a teacher of men who gladly welcomes strange things. He led away many Jews and also many of the Gentiles. He was the so-called Christ. Now remember, this man was not a Christian. He was very pro-Roman. And he says, this Jesus, he says, of course, was the supposed Christ. Mm -hmm. When Pilate, acting on information supplied by the chief men among us, condemned him to the cross, those who had attached themselves to him at first did not cease to cause trouble. And the tribe of Christians, which has taken his, this name from him, is not extinct, extinct even today. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he hasn't got a case to put for Christians. He's just recording what happened. 
That's pretty powerful, isn't it? Well, he was employed, I think, by the court of the emperor around the time that he wrote these things. Yeah. So he's attempting to explain, I think, to the Roman world about things that were going on in the, in the Jewish part of the empire. Yeah. So this is interesting. His quote is very significant. Also, we have Tacitus and Pliny, and you'd uh -huh. be familiar with those men. Yeah, well, Tacitus uh, was a, a historian also in the court of Trajan, probably knew Josephus. Pliny is even more significant because he was the governor of a major province about 10 years after the book of Revelation was written. Mm -hmm. So uh, Tacitus and Pliny uh, both uh, describe things that they are aware of in the uh, earthly life of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And the next generation of Christians, Clement and Ignatius, uh, they are also referring to Jesus mm -hmm. and he was yeah. a real person who died and rose again. Interestingly, Clement actually writes at the very time Revelation was probably written. Uh, mm -hmm. He wrote a letter to the churches uh, and uh, that we generally date that about 96 AD within a year or two of when most people think uh, the book of Revelation was written. Mm. Ignatius, interestingly enough, visited some of these same churches about 10 years uh, mm. after the time that Revelation was written. So we're really going very close. All of these, Very close to all of these are people who were alive when Revelation was written, mm. uh, who were close enough to the events to have some uh, knowledge of Jesus, at least as much as, as I have of Hitler, mm. you see, mm. because uh, my mother and others have talked about uh, going through some of those times, some of the experiences that they had. Sure. So if I was a lawyer in court mm. presenting a case and evidence, and if I was a person weighing up history, Mm -hmm. I would say a fair person would have to say Jesus was a real person mm -hmm. who really lived. Okay. He was put to death. Yeah. The question is, is he alive? Yeah. Now I have a colleague at Avondale College, Robert MacGyver, uh -huh. and he has some comments on, is Jesus alive today? I read something interesting the other day. It's in a book by Alistair McGrath entitled Doubt. He says, to believe in God demands an act of faith, as does the decision not to believe in him. Actually, that's an interesting thought, isn't it? Christians have to deal with doubt. They believe, but there are some things that they don't have good answers for. Now, if I was a non-Christian, if I doubted Jesus, I would have one miracle that would worry me more than anything else. That's the miracle of the resurrection. You see, there are several things that we know for sure. We know Jesus died. We know where he was, that people knew where he was buried. We know that the tomb was empty. We know that nobody ever produced a body. We know that thousands of his followers died believing that they had seen the resurrected Jesus. All of these are important things. Now, if I was a non-Christian, how would I explain this away? Well, I might try and say, Jesus never properly died. Well... They knew what dead was like in the ancient world, especially the soldiers. And when Jesus was found dead early, they decided to make sure of it and they put a spear right through into his heart. The fact that the disciples may have seen the resurrected Jesus is explained by hallucinations. Well, that really doesn't fit how hallucinations fit. So for me, if I was a non-Christian, I would be most worried about the miracle of the resurrection because there's some facts that I find hard to explain. On the other hand, I'm a believer, so I find these facts point to the fact that Jesus really did rise from the dead. You know, John, there was an empty tomb. Of that, there's no question. There was an empty tomb. Christians never went back to worship at, at, at that tomb. And you say, well, why didn't they go back and worship at the tomb? Well, the, what do you think? That's a good point. No, that's, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. It was normal to worship at the yeah. tomb of a holy person, wasn't yeah, it? That's right. Yeah. All through the ancient world. Christians never did it. Uh -huh. In fact, today, there's always still the dispute to this very day where the tomb was. Uh -huh. But they didn't worship there. So there was an empty tomb, we believe. Now, if the Jews had had the body, who had the body? If the Jews had had it, they could have just simply produced that body and wiped out Christianity quick like that, couldn't they? Yeah. The Jews didn't have it. There was a story circulating that the disciples had stolen the body. Mm -hmm. But of course, if the disciples stole the body, then they went up and down this land of Palestine telling people, Jesus is alive and we've seen him. Now, people tell lies to get 
out of trouble, not into trouble. Mm -hmm. What did they get out of it? They got beaten, thrown in prison. Many of them died a martyr's death, a cruel death, but mm -hmm. not one broke rank. They mm -hmm. all said to the very end of their lives, Jesus is alive. Mm. And if we went to court and produced this sort of evidence, we would say they are very good evidence, very good witnesses, aren't they? Mm. Men who prepared to die for what they believe are very good witnesses. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Well, I guess the question that comes to us now, you know, you've made an amazing case that Jesus actually lived, uh, that he died. And uh, I mean, empty tomb, there's no historian is going to find an explanation for that. None of the usual roads make any sense, mm. except the one that is actually claimed mm. uh, that he was raised from the dead. That's amazing to us. Mm. It's absolutely astounding, but it, it now raises the question, what do we do with that? Mm. If in fact God came down, if in fact uh, he sent his son, uh, a metaphor of course, to this earth, he walks this earth and so on, what do we do with that? Mm. How does that affect our lives? Mm. That becomes the crucial question. Absolutely. And Absolutely. Uh, we are going to go to a break now. Mm. When we come back from the break, we're going to join Pamela over in the interview room and she's going to explore with us together what difference does it make? What does it mean to accept Jesus into your life? That becomes the crucial question. Absolutely. Welcome back. Uh, we're here in the interview room with Pamela and uh, she will be joining us uh, throughout these programs from time to time uh, to ask the kind of questions that uh, Bible scholars don't learn the answers to in school. In other words, the really, really important questions. But before we do that, uh, we'd like to do just a couple of other things. And one of those is complete our walk through chapter one of Revelation. And uh, I'll invite Graham to share uh, just a little bit of what we've done so far in today's program. Sure. We've been looking at Jesus and we've seen him revealed as we've never seen him before anywhere in Scripture. And uh, we've seen him there in dressed almost as it were a priest with Jewish imagery from the Old Testament sanctuary imagery. And we've seen Jesus making claim to the fact that he was dead, he's alive and he has the keys of death and of Hades. And uh, we finished that last program full of hope because Jesus is, according to the evidence we've seen, no longer dead, he rose. And because he lives, we will live too. And we can encourage people now to believe and trust in Jesus. Because he lives, we have a hope, a meaning, a purpose for the future. And to trust in Jesus, you know, you give your life to him. You surrender your life to Him. And we're all sinners. We know we're sinners. But God is not interested in what we've done in the past. God is only looking at one thing. What is your present attitude? Do you trust in Jesus? Do you give your life to Him? And if you do, you have eternal life the moment you believe and trust in Jesus. And that's good news, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to sort of work hard at being a better person and being a better person. Am I ever going to be good enough? Mm -hmm. You'll never have assurance if you look at Christianity that way. The moment you surrender your life to Jesus, you have eternal life. The Bible says in the Gospel about Jesus, as many as believed in Him, to Him gave them power to become the sons of God. And it says also in John's first epistle, He who has the Son has life. We have it right here and now. And I want to say, Pamela and John, we believe that there is nothing more precious in this world and to have that assurance that God loves and accepts me. It makes a big difference. What we've done here is starting with the beginning of chapter one, we saw even in plain language, it was telling us that uh, it's all about the, the death, the life, the resurrection of Jesus. That is, is crucial to it. He loved us yeah. and washed us with his blood. Yeah. It says in that very first chapter, doesn't it? Uh -huh. It does. Now, I want to uh, come back to the very last part of chapter one, and that's Revelation 1 and uh, verse 19. I think it's very, very significant to understanding the book of Revelation. Let's take a look at that text. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, 
and what will take place later. Now this text here is telling us two things. John has seen a vision and he is supposed to write. What is he supposed to write? He is to write uh, what the things which are and the things which will happen later on. Now we will discover as we move into the next couple of chapters, he's describing the things which are, the situation of the seven churches of Asia Minor. Then beginning with chapter four, he moves to the things that will be in the future. So chapter one, verse 19 is like a guidepost text. I think you like to call them, yeah, Graham, yeah. in that it, it gives us guidance to the bigger picture of the book of Revelation. Mm. So chapter one is kind of a foundation of everything that happens. It shows that as crazy as the symbols get, mm. uh, the rest of the book is really about the gospel. Mm. It's really at some point about Jesus. It's about how trusting Jesus, about putting your life in his hands, mm. really makes all the difference. You know, it's one difference. thing to believe in Jesus, it's, mm. uh, but to keep believing, keep trusting, even mm. when things go wrong, Revelation is helping us because Jesus has told us there will be an end. Yeah. And Revelation becomes a very important part of this. But trusting in Jesus, maintaining that faith, maintaining that trust, you know, it's not always so easy, is it? Mm. It can be difficult, but we believe that God is there and we can, we can put our hand in His hand and we can give our hearts to Jesus. And that's, that's what Christianity is all about, isn't it? Now, Pamela, I think uh, you were challenging us a little bit at the break. What, what were you saying there? I think we need to hear that. Well, how do you know you're trusting Jesus? And some people might just say, trust Jesus, trust Jesus. But what if you feel like you're really not trusting Jesus and you just say you're trusting Jesus? Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? What does that mean, trusting yeah, Jesus? Trusting Jesus. I did, they didn't teach me that in, in graduate school. You're getting to where the rubber meets the road. <laughs> <laughs> we like to throw out yeah. our cliches and our yeah. words and say, okay, yeah. give your heart to Jesus, you know. Uh -huh. My little girl, when she's a little toddler, we used to have her pin a heart on a flannel graph. Give your heart to Jesus. Yeah. But obviously that was, well, what does was that more mean? than that. <laughs> you can't take your heart out and hand it, right? Is, no. that, is that what you're saying? You know, and, and we, we use these cliches sometimes. Uh, some time ago I was, uh, I was sitting next to an individual on an airplane and, and that person was, was uh, saying, you know, I've, I've just met a Christian and I don't know what I'm getting into. Mm. And I said, well, would you like to know what mm. you're getting into? Mm. You see, and that I think is, can you say to somebody right off the street, never been to church, no contact with Christian faith, what does it mean? Really, what difference mm. does Jesus make? I'd like to put something on the screen and uh, it talks about various relationships that we have. You see on the screen there, uh, the X person can be you or me. And uh, all of us tend to have a relationship with the earth and a relationship with other people. Now the typical person, in the street tries to find meaning and value. Everybody needs to find value in their life. What, what makes me worth somebody, uh, worth something? Why, uh, why should I live this life? What difference can I make? And many people seek to find their value in possessions. That's that downward uh, relationship, the relationship with the earth. What are you worth? Oh, uh, so much in stocks and bonds, probably uh, less than a couple of years ago, you know? Uh, people value themselves in terms of their things. The trouble is things don't last. Stock markets crash. Uh, uh, houses can burn down. The things that you depend on don't last. So other people trust in their achievements. And they say, well, uh, you know, I've got a PhD or I'm president of the corporation or I've done this and I've done that. The trouble is uh, achievements don't last either. Mm. Uh, the football player gets old, uh, body begins to fall apart, the teacher goes senile, uh, the, the beauty queen begins to lose uh, those aspects uh, that have been attributed to her. A and so you can't really trust in achievement either. Mm. So other people trust in relationships. They say it's who you know that mm. counts. And, well, if I know this famous person or I know that famous person, uh, then I'm somebody, and yet those are human beings, mm. just like we are, mm. you see? So we were looking for life, we're looking for quality of life, we're looking for meaning in all of these places, and none of them truly satisfy. 
Even the best friend on this earth could be taken from you tomorrow by death, or they could divorce you, reject you, move away. Yeah. So what is the way out? I suggest four things. If we find a friend who's truly meaningful, not just another human being like a Hollywood starlet or a president of the United States, somebody who's really valuable, somebody who knows everything there is to know about you, somebody who loves you just the way you are, and somebody who lives forever. If you knew a friend like that, you could find meaning and value in life that would be truly lasting. And that's what Jesus is all about. That's what this, it's trusting, it's, it's having the sense that he really existed, that he really lived. You know, you can't prove that Jesus actually lived. Mm. You can't prove that he was raised from the dead. Historical evidence is solid, That's as we right. demonstrated. At some point, the evidence is limited. But Graham, yeah. what would you suggest yeah. in that case? Pamela's opened up a very important point because all that we've presented so far in this program, all the evidence can only take you so far. Yeah. In the end, there's a leap of faith. You know, God is someone to be experienced. It's mm -hmm. like falling in love with somebody, and you know that, and how much you, you, you spend time together. You get to know each other and trust each other as you enter that relationship. Christianity is like a romance and we fall in love with God, and the more we get to know Him, the more we believe He is trustworthy. And He responds by granting us His Holy Spirit inside. And the Apostle Paul says that inner witness of the Spirit is like a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. If I put $50,000 down on a deposit on a home, it means I intend to buy that home. Mm -hmm. How do I know I'm a Christian? How do I know God loves me? There is an inner work of the Holy Spirit where we have a new life from within, and it's something we experience. And so I would challenge people, people watching this program at this time, to try God out, put Him to the test, take the promises, and have this experience with God. All we present here, any friend, any, any loved one can only take you so far. In the end, you have to come to know God as a friend yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and yet, despite all this, next program coming up, we're going to deal with one of the greatest problems Christians face in maintaining that relationship. If God is so good, why do we have so much suffering in this world? That's our next program. Thank you very much for watching this program and we'll enjoy meeting with you next time. If you've enjoyed this presentation on the Book of Revelation and would like more information, visit www.revelationhope.com. You can purchase your own DVD set of this series or the booklets which cover the content of each program.